to ask Josh. Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait a minute or so to allow people to join us. Thank you for being here. If you're just joining now, we're just gonna start in a couple of minutes, uh, allowing people to, to file in. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rania Batrice. I'm a 2024 Palestinian non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace, who is hosting us today. Welcome to today's webinar, Resigned, the former Biden administration officials who left their jobs over Gaza. Today is April 12th, 2024, and I just want to jump into a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into questions. The format for today's webinar will be discussion between the panelists and myself. We'll end around 3.15 p.m. Eastern time. It is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. So hello to everybody in Facebook world who's joining us. Uh, we're eager to take audience questions. So please submit them. You'll see the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of your Zoom window. And you can go ahead and submit those at any time throughout the panel. I'm going to be keeping an eye on that box and do my best to include as many of those questions as possible and possibly weave them into questions that we have that are existing. Um, also, please keep an eye on the chat box. My colleagues at FMEP will be putting links that we are referencing throughout the this discussion into that chat box and, and you'll be able to take a look at those, save them if you'd like, read them later. And also a note on accessibility, please note that we have enabled the closed caption function so you can read the discussion as well. Um, so without further ado, FMEP is honored to host Josh Paul, Tarek Habesh, and Anel Sheline for their first joint public appearance and conversation over their individual decisions to resign from their jobs in the Biden administration over pre the president's policy on Israel Palestine, and the ongoing atrocities in Gaza. We're going to discuss personal stakes, choices, the costs of public protest against the U.S.'s close embrace of Israel and Netanyahu and his regime, and its brutal attacks on Gaza, as well as the Biden administration's policy and decision-making and the possibilities for changing course, which I know so many of us have been desperate for for so long. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tarek, Josh, and Anel. I'm going to introduce each of you briefly and ask you a question within, within that introduction. And I do invite the audience, these are very short introductions because we got a lot to get into, but their fuller bios are on the FMAP landing page. So I'm just going to jump right on in. Josh, I'm going to start with you. You're the former Director of Congressional and Public Affairs in the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs in the U.S. Department of State, a position from which you resigned in October of 2023 of last year. You were the first public resignation from the Biden administration in opposition to the U.S. policy as it relates to Israel and Gaza. At the State Department, you worked in defense diplomacy, security assistance, and arms transfers. So I want to just dive on in and have you tell our audience anything else you want us to know about you, 
and, and the work that you've done. And also talk about the statement you published on LinkedIn explaining your resignation. We're sharing that link, um, but just a, a quick quote from, from that statement, quote, my responsibilities lay solidly in the arms transfer space. While I can and have worked hard to shape better policy making in the, sorry, better policy making in the security assistance field, I cannot work in support of a major set of policy, policy decisions, including rushing arms to one side of the conflict that I believe to be short-sighted, destructive, unjust, and contradictory to the very values we publicly espouse. So I, I'd love for you to talk to us about your resignation. Obviously what you did wasn't easy um, and you had to weigh a lot of consequences, including personal ones. So tell us why you decided to do it in the time you did. And um, you know, you've been part of the State Department for 11 years. So why were these specific arms transfers at this time what drove you out of your position? Great, thank you, uh, Rania. And let me start also by by thanking you, uh, Sarah Ann and FMAP uh, for bringing the three of us together. Uh, I think this is the first uh, event that uh, each of us three have done together. Um, and I just want to say to Tarek and Linnell uh, that I, I look forward to future events, hopefully uh, in happier times. Um, but. So yeah, thank you for those questions, uh, Rania. I think, um, you know, regarding the position I found myself in, uh, you know, after October 7th, as you noted, I was working in the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs uh, in the State Department. And in that role, uh, part of my direct responsibilities included that I was in the chain of approval uh, for all major arms transfers. And so for me, uh, this whole situation was something that was very quickly, very relevant uh, and and not simply because it is something that the U.S. was doing that I didn't agree with, something others in State Department were working on that I had a problem with. Uh, it was that I was directly being asked to approve the arms transfers uh, that you know at this point have killed uh, about, if not higher, thirty than thirty five thousand Palestinians in Gaza. Um, and of course, you know this comes on on the end of a I think a lengthy policy failure as regards the Israeli Palestinian conflict peace process, whatever you want to call it. Um, that has not led to peace or security for anyone, uh, not for the Palestinians, obviously, but also not for Israelis. Um, and that is also, you know, at this point, particularly doing lasting uh, damage to American interests in the region and around the world. Um, so, you know, for me, this was not a, a matter of theory. This was really something, something you know, immediate. Um, you know, you mentioned my resignation statement and, you know, I haven't looked at it recently. I think the last time I, I reread it was probably a couple of months ago. Um, but just recalling it, I, I think, unfortunately, um, you know, people have said to me, would you would you write the same things now? And I, I suspect the only difference I would make maybe is that I'll be more strident because I think so much of what I feared at that time uh, has come true, that we see, you know, more and deeper suffering uh, for so many people, you know, in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, uh, in Israel too, and around the region. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that this was all very predictable um, at the time that I left. Um, you asked, you know, what made this particularly different or why now? And, and part of the answer to that, right, is that, you know, in working in political military affairs and working in the fields of security and assistance and arms transfers, uh, you deal on a daily basis with a lot of hard choices, hard decisions, uh, wicked problems for which there are no good answers. So you just try to choose what is the least bad, um, you know, and, and this was a context, and I think this is really a microcosm probably of, of America writ large, but certainly in the State Department, where there was not a space for discussion and debate on this issue set, where there was no opportunity to really make anything better, certainly at least from where I was sitting at that time. Um, and that's what made this different from previous issues where I might have disagreed with administration policy, but felt that I could contribute constructively. There was just no opportunity to do that here. Um, and that is, you know, between that and the devastation that was being un unre uh, unleashed, the devastation that was clear to follow uh, was, you know, why that was the point at which I drew my line and left. Thank you so much, Josh. And I, I just wanted to point out one thing that you said. I mean, so much of what you said is really important. We see oftentimes a lot of armchair quarterbacking and things like that. But one of the points you just made that I think is so imperative is we saw where this was going early on 
you know, it wasn't, it's not as though, oh my gosh, we had no idea this is what was going to happen. And, and to, to what you just named, and I just think, again, it's so massively important. You saw that writing on the wall and you made, you tried to, to name it to your colleagues, et cetera. And so I just, I, I have to say thank you. Um, and also, yes, so many of us saw what was coming yeah. and and you did as well. And I think that's just a, such an important point. Um, I'm going to move over to you, Tarek. You were a political appointee and a policy advisor in the Department of Education's policy office. You are also the only Palestinian American political appointee in that department. Your resignation came on January 3rd, 2024, this year. Uh, and I'm quoting here from your letter, which we'll also share the link to. I mourn each and every loss, Israeli and Palestinian, but I cannot represent an, an administration that does not value all human life equally. I cannot stay silent as this administration turns a blind eye to the atrocities committed against innocent Palestinian lives in what leading human rights experts have called a genocidal campaign by the Israeli government. Will you just talk to us about your resignation, how your identity as a Palestinian American shaped your experience of being in the administration and what it meant to you to work for this president, to be an appointee, it's no small thing, and, and how your Palestinian American identity and just your humanity in general is connected to your resignation. And, and one more thing I'll add is, I gave a very short intro to you and your work. Will you share with our audience anything else you want them to know about you? Because obviously I know things about you, but you are an issue area expert in very important ways that I think folks should understand. Yeah, I re really appreciate just this opportunity and for um, for you bringing us together, Anya, and just thank my panelists both for the courageous steps that they took. Uh, having having done it myself, I know how much thought and pain goes into making a decision to resign from um, a job that you know you likely took not for the lucrative income, but because you believe in public service and making the world a better place. And I think um, we all really value, you know, our democracy, our institutions, our uh, our roles as world leaders and Americans on a global stage. And for me, it was truly like an honor to be politically appointed to, um, to the administration um, and to have helped shape the education policy agenda for the campaign when I volunteered for months uh, leading up to um, the Biden administration taking over. And, you know, my expertise was in racial equity and higher education finance and student loan issues. And I came to the administration to really work on all of those issues. And I believe that every single day that I was in the administration, I brought a unique perspective. Like you said, I was the only Palestinian American in the uh, in the Department of Education, that was a political appointee, and there were Palestinian Americans in other corners of the administration, but we are not uh, by any means like extremely prominent. And I think our presence, our identities, the the histories that we bring, and the knowledge that we have about how Palestinians have. Um, have suffered for decades um, under occupation and apartheid, it is really important to have those voices in the halls of power, in agencies that are doing really important federal policy and public policy work to advance equity and justice. And, you know, for, for the vast majority of my time in the administration, I truly felt like that perspective was coming through in my work. I, I believe that it was making a, a substantive difference in making education and higher education in particular um, better for millions of Americans. Um, and unfortunately, there was a shift. And for me, that shift was when um, it was clear that the administration did not want to reflect all perspectives on a particular issue that while it was a foreign policy issue primarily, it certainly has had um, lasting effects on domestic policy, whether that is what is happening in K-12 schools 
or across colleges and universities and on campuses. Um, and that reality is that, you know, the administration was not willing to ensure that Palestinians were seen as human, as seen as like being worthy and deserving of the same humanity that the administration was um, emphasizing was critical to provide for Israelis. And I think like my point was it that Palestinians deserve more humanity, it's just that we deserve to be seen as equal, we deserve to be seen as human. And I think like, it was really hard to be part of a government that I purportedly represented, but did not see my value, see my humanity or see my identity. And it was, it was dehumanizing to hear the president, you know, say that he had seen images that, you know, he didn't see to see, to hear that the president had uh, doubts about the number of Palestinians who were killed to see our policies every single day um, that didn't align with my values, that made excuses for repeated violations of international humanitarian law because, well, it, these violations are happening against Palestinians. And so that exception is something that we are willing to tolerate. And it was just untenable to continue to do the really important work that I felt like was necessary and continues to be necessary across education issues, across social justice issues and racial equity um, that really provide a real opportunity for progress and growth um, in our own country. Oh, thank you so much. I was so, so many things. I felt like nodding emphatically because yes, 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 yes. And also obviously lived experience. I, I too obviously am Palestinian American. So there's, I, I just feel that so deeply. And also something that you said that I think is so important. And you and I have actually talked about this before too, that I often say people in this country don't care about foreign policy until something happens. And there's this tendency to feel like oh, that doesn't affect me. This is not my life. I don't need to worry about that. And so much of what you just said, which I know we'll, we'll dive into more later, it, it is sort of naming that, yes, it all of this, we all, this world is getting smaller and smaller and everything that's happening impacts all of us, whether you're Palestinian American or not. So thank you. Thank you so much again. And thank you for you just being here and, and sharing your story. Um, and, and now I'm going to I'm going to jump over to you. You were a foreign affairs officer at the Office of Near Eastern Affairs in the Department of State's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. In your resignation letter, which was published on CNN, and we'll drop that link in as well, you said, quote, for the past year, I worked for the office devoted to promoting human rights in the Middle East. I believe strongly in the mission and in the important work of that office. However, as a representative of, the gov of a government that is directly enabling what the International Court of Justice has said could plausibly be genocide in Gaza, such work has become almost impossible. Unable to serve an administration that enables such atrocities, I've decided to resign from my position at the Department of State. Whatever credibility the United States had as an advocate for human rights has almost entirely vanished since the war began. Members of civil society have re refused to respond to my efforts to contact them. Our office seeks to support journalists in the Middle East, yet when asked by NGOs if the US can help when Palestinian journalists are detained or killed in Gaza, I was disappointed that my government didn't do more to protect them. So I just wanna ask you to talk to us, of course, about your decision to resign anything else that, that you want the audience to know and what was kind of the last straw for you? You resigned on March 27th of this year. So tell us a little bit about why then. Well, first, it's so great to be here. Um, right before I was going to resign publicly, I, I was able to speak with Josh and Tarek, or Josh put me in touch with Tarek. Um, and it was just really helpful to sort of not only to get to to feel like, you know, I, I sort of already had a, a small community of, of others out there, um, but but I got more support as well from groups like Feds United for Peace, for example, which is, and again, these groups is, is a misnomer because these are just kind of 
um, signal threads of people who are still in government and are horrified by what's happening and are trying to do what they can on the inside. Also wanted to um, acknowledge the um, Institute for Middle East Understanding, which was also extremely helpful in, um, in the aftermath as I was just kind of trying to respond to media. But in terms of my kind of the timing of my resignation. So in the aftermath of October 7th, Rania, as you said, it was clear quite early on, we were hearing statements from Israeli officials, what their intentions were. And, you know, these have been part of the, the case that South Africa brought at the International Court of Justice, that the intent to commit genocide was clearly established. And so fairly early, I hoped that by still being on the inside, I mean, again, quite junior, I'd only started, I, I only spent a, a total of one year at the State Department and October 7th happened after I'd been there about six months. But I wanted to do what I could on the inside. And I was working with the office, trying to promote human rights in the Middle East. And, you know, the, the people inside my office as well as I were quite committed to that that goal and and really um, felt that the work we were doing was really crucial. Um, and and so I felt that uh, there were allies around me um, in terms of trying to push for for something different. Um, I was able to co author a dissent cable. I then signed two other dissent cables to just register opposition. But over time, it did become clear that even though I knew that people higher up the chain, including people like Josh, but who left, but other people still on the inside who were registering how this was not only directly in contravention of American values or the values this administration claimed to espouse, but that we were breaking US laws as well as international law. And yet none of that was having any impact. I started to think more about resigning I decided to wait until I, I, so I had a service obligation to the government. And while I, I could have just left earlier, um, part of my reasoning was also that our office was completing the human rights reports. And, you know, people inside state will, will understand, will, will, it'll resonate that there, there are already fairly significant staffing issues inside the State Department. Um, there, there are not enough people to do the important work that state does. And so I didn't want to leave my team high and dry with the five reports that I, I was responsible for. So I decided I would I would complete my 365 days of, of service obligation and, and then I would resign after that. Um, but I did let it be known ahead of time to my supervisors that that I was resigning over Gaza. I just I, I didn't know in, um, until about a week in advance that I, that I that I was going to make the decision to do it publicly. Initially, I, I just planned to kind of do it quietly the way the way other people have done. Yeah, and I, I, I think it's, I don't want to say nobody, right? Definitive things like nobody and never and all of that. But I feel like rarely do people get into government work. Tark, you mentioned it's not like no one's in there making tons and tons of money, right? So I feel like there is this sense of I'm I'm going on the inside to to have a positive impact to to impact positive change um and you know and the, and to your point too I know that you mentioned there have been other resignations that have happened quietly um for the same reasons and you know and I think that we're seeing this kind of through line I know y'all are having these conversations I've had them as well where it was like I tried and tried and tried and got nowhere. And how many times am I going to bang my head against the brick wall before I'm like, okay. Um, so again, thanks to all of you for, for doing what you did with such moral clarity um, and, and such decisive words. I think it, it makes a big difference. And, and I, and somebody actually put in the, in the question box, do Kirby and others think that we actually believe what they're saying. And I'm just, get, I'm going to answer that question. I think they hope that we do. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, and for, for decades, quite frankly, there has been this, you know, pop propaganda wheel churning with little to no recourse. People's eyes are being opened in a way that has not necessarily happened in the past. And it's for a lot of reasons. I mean, there's people in the streets and also that what the three of you did, that can't be ignored, 
as much as people want it to be, certain people, it can't be ignored. So thanks to all of you again. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to dive right back into you, Tariq, and your resignation announcement. Again, you wrote about your Palestinian American identity. Another, just a quote from that, from that statement, as a Palestinian American man descending from generations of Palestinian Christians, I experienced each day the dehumanization and erasure of my identity by my peers, by the media, and by my own government. My family lived through the Nakba in 1948, where hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were violently and forcibly expelled from their homes. My grandparents, aunts, and uncles walked over 35 miles from Yatha to Lida in eventually Ramallah just to survive. For more, for 75 years, my relatives have never been allowed to return to their family homes. Millions of Palestinians have faced decades of occupation, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid. And the Biden administration's passive acceptance of the status quo is wholly out of line with democratic values. Our government continues to provide unconditional military funding to the government that is uninterested in protecting innocent lives. We've seen thousands of children, over a hundred journalists and countless medical professionals killed in Gaza. These deaths are unjust. They violate our moral obligation as stewards of our country's tax dollars. They violate our obligation to abide by international humanitarian law and they violate every level of human decency. Some of this you talked about already in your previous answer, but I just, such powerful words I think need deserve to be repeated. And, and in case anyone who's watching had not heard them or read them or seen them before, I, I'm glad that they are now because it's they're really important. Um, so Ian, you've been very clear, October 7th was hor horrific, um, but Israeli violence against Palestinians didn't begin there. And you spoke explicitly, explicitly about the Nakba, which for so many people in this country, that's new information. As much as some of us have been like banging that drum and trying to educate people on the history, still not necessarily something everybody knew about. You wrote about your family and how personal that is to you um, and, and connected it to your everyday work experience, which again, you mentioned previously of, we often hear, you know, if you can't, it, it, being seen and heard is so important. And that was, I guess, the opposite of what you were experiencing. So. Were you able to speak this truth it, within the administration, um, your own experience, your family's experience about the occupation, about ethnic cleansing and apartheid, words that were in your statement while you were still holding your position within the administration? Yeah, no, I really appreciate this question. And I and I will say, to a certain extent, yes, particularly after October 7th, there were opportunities to actually engage um, and have conversations. These listening sessions happened within the Department of Education. They happened with, um, with the White House, with the different policy councils. Um, but they were just that. They were listening sessions. They weren't learning sessions. They weren't digesting sessions, they certainly weren't understanding sessions. And I think that like it was mostly just creating the opportunity for you to have like just a way to express how you're feeling so that you can feel like, you know what, someone important heard what you had to say, but we're certainly not going to reflect on that and then have that information and knowledge and experiential like learning affect anything that we're doing because at the end of the day we are set it's clear now I think like after three months it was clear after two months it was clear but the administration is fairly set in stone in its policies and no amount of um, personal experience or understanding about the the unequal treatment of Palestinians was going to um, to affect the policy in one way or another, no matter how many people expressed concerns about that. It just seems like the administration, the president, wanted to treat this issue like an ideologue would. And I think it has resulted in really catastrophic levels of violence and famine and violations of international humanitarian law. 
And I think like there's a fundamental problem with really how American discourse for decades really has had an apathy toward, but in some ways just an outright lack of knowledge of how Palestinians are affected by this unequal treatment, by apartheid, by occupation, and what that actually means. And for Palestinians, like we know it, we live it, our families lived it every single day. Like you mentioned that I talk about my family's Nakba story. Every Palestinian in the diaspora whose families were forcibly expelled in 1948 have similar stories, some much more horrific than mine. And it's a really unfortunate reality that we continue to find ways to educate our peers, our community members, our colleagues about the, the discrimination that we as Palestinians and our families had experienced when they lived in the region and even since when people refuse to acknowledge how that discrimination, how that violence, how that forcible displacement and ethnic cleansing affects us both on a personal and emotional level, but also on a familial level, on a uh, national identity level. Like I'm, I'm an American, but I am also a Palestinian and I'm proud of both of those things. And I think that people who, who have families who originate from other countries are proud of that in other circumstances too. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's great that we can be proud of our identities and our family heritage and our shared ancestry. And, and that's just, that's an important component of our identity. And it's something that despite having opportunities to talk about it within the administration, I don't think that it was ever looked at as more than just anecdotal or just looked at as something other than, you know, well, that's your personal experience, but this is a different issue. And so we have to set that aside so that the grownups can talk. Yeah, which is incredible to me, because if they had any conversations with any other Palestinian people, they would have seen that through line, too. And I know, again, you and I have spoken about this to your point about the familial impact. I like we've talked about my parents are terrified for me every day. And in part, it is. It is the way this country has treated us for decades. And in part, it is what they experienced themselves before they immigrated. And so yet again, have a couple conversations and you'll see you're, you're not you're not an exception in your story. There is a through line here. So again, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna uh, ask Anel and Josh just some specifics about the atmosphere within the State Department. And I know you mentioned some of the kind of the dissent memos you actually uh, filed yourself, but there's there was an independent, uh, the independent published an article earlier this week titled State Department Sees Unprecedented Flood of Internal Dissent Memos Over Gaza War, revealing that the State Department staff has sent at least eight internal dissent memos, I'm assuming it's actually probably far more, to express disagreement with US policy on Israel and Gaza. Um, that was during the first two months. And for just comparison sakes, they note that only one internal dissent memo was filed in the first three years of the US war in Iraq, which I feel like we could spend a whole episode unpacking that. We'll do that some other time, but we'll drop links into the chat. But Josh, I'm just gonna start with you. If you'll just talk a little bit about what you saw within the State Department in the beginning of this invasion and what you've continued hearing if you have through through your contacts there yeah no i certainly have continued hearing i think uh you know this question anel's information will certainly be more contemporary than mine given uh that she's been you know a part of that mix more recently uh but but i would say first of all in, in the current moment i continue to hear from former colleagues uh within the state department and more broadly from across the u.s government uh who are you know reaching out to say you know what else can we do here? How can we shift things? How can we get our voices heard? How can we have an impact? Uh, and I think there remains, uh, you know, an immense amount of frustration. Um, that was already certainly the case at the time that I left. Uh, I think, you know, perhaps that frustration is a bit less afraid to speak its name now, as it were, 
um, in the sense that, you know, shortly after October 7th, for example, you know, a couple of days after October 7th, um, as Israel's, you know, attacks on Gaza unfolded, uh, as we started to accelerate arms deliveries, you know, I, I wrote an email to a number of colleagues uh, and senior officials within the department um, that essentially said, hey, let's let's pause on this. Let's think about what's happening. Let's look at the impacts. Um, and, you know, it was met with, you know, written silence. No one wrote back to my email, but but people did say to me, you know, you know, pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I, I don't think you should be sending emails like that, but I totally agree with you. Um, and, you know, my perception is that I think many of those same people who, who might have, you know, at that point said, ooh, bit edgy, you know, I agree, but, but you know, shh, you'll be in trouble, uh, are probably now more prone to speaking up. Um, and that, that is increasing some of the internal pressure. Um, and yet at the same time, here we are six months on, um, and I think we have to acknowledge that the major driver of any shift in U.S. policy, and that shift, I think, has been very late, very incremental, deeply insufficient. Um, the major driver is Israel's own actions, Israel's own violations and behaviors, uh, and just how visible those have become over the last six months. Uh, but but let me hand it over to Anel for a better look at where things stand now. Yeah, And I'm going to just read another quote from your letter and now, because I think it's important. So many of my, this is a quote from your, from your statement. So many of my colleagues feel betrayed. Across the federal government, employees like me have tried for months to influence policy, both internally and when that failed publicly. My colleagues and I watched in horror as this administration delivered thousands of precision guided munitions, bombs and small arms and other lethal aid to Israel and authorized thousands more even bypassing Congress to do so, we are appalled by the administration's flagrant disregard for American laws that prohibit the US from providing assistance to foreign militaries that engage in gross human rights violations or that restrict the delivery of humanitarian aid. And, and we know at least twice those those um, arms were, were given by bypassing Congress. And, and I think there's information coming out about that. But either way, I just love for you to talk to all of us about what you observed at the State Department and in the government more broadly. And, and to Josh's point, just more recently, you know, he had he's kind of given us his perspective. Did that did you feel any kind of shift more recently? Um, you know, I, I think that. It's. I, my sense is that people are shocked that it's been allowed to go on this long, um, you know, that we were concerned about, you know, the fact that there wasn't food getting in early on and sort of like the immediate effects of that versus like now we're in famine conditions. Like, I just, I think that many of the people who continue to be on the inside to try to have an impact who are working directly on this policy and to be clear Israel Palestine was not one of the countries I was covering I was mostly looking at um, North Africa and human rights there but colleagues who are directly working on this who you know I think inside the State Department there is sort of a belief in the process there's a belief in diplomacy you have to sort of go through the motions and follow the steps and I think earlier on, people were still willing to believe in that, that, you know, we know Blinken's going over there. We know he's making these statements. OK, nothing's changing. OK, well, now the president has made a statement and still nothing's changing. And so, I mean, I, you know, this at least was my own calculus of how even though we we were starting to see, you know, in like the talking points, for example, the US was was saying things, but that we were not seeing any consequences. So, you know, for my colleagues inside state who continue to work on this, I do think my understanding is, you know, it's really um, there are deep concerns about the fact that this administration is not adhering to US law, as, as you uh, referenced from the, the op-ed I published. Um, and a point that I'll just make there to, to, to make it political, I mean, this gets, you know, we're in an election year and Biden is going up against someone um, who flagrantly disregards the law and 
Biden's whole thing is, you know, he's better than that. That's not who he is. He had he's a compassionate person. He follows the law. He's just sort of, you know, more of a normal president. And increasingly, that is falling apart as we see these Orwellian statements coming from the White House spokesperson saying that they have not found Israel to be in violation of humanitarian law, of international law, not engaging in gross violations of human rights. This just feels very Trumpian um, and this sort of set of alternative facts. So I veered away from your question a little bit as far as kind of the mood inside the State Department, but I, I do think that um, Unfortunately, another question I've gotten a lot is why haven't we seen more resignations and I my understanding, um, you know, I remember when Josh resigned and myself and others were really impressed. Um, it just seemed very badass. Um, but, but I, you know, the message we were getting from higher up was much more negative negative. Um, and that my understanding is that has also been the reaction to my resignation. Um, and in, in particular, I do think for colleagues inside state who, who you know, not only have spent their careers inside government, but who, who want to continue to be able to affect policy in the future and hope that by being on the inside, they will be able to contribute to better policies. I would just challenge that thinking because the government is populated by people who got into it to try to make a difference. And yet we do continue to see horrifying policies on this issue, on many issues. And so I just would challenge people to really think about at which point do you have to stop kidding yourself that, you know, your presence on the inside is like really contributing to a shift. Unfortunately, um, many people get into government because they do have, they want to make a difference and they believe in the US government. Um, but I just think structural factors here um, just make it really difficult for kind of the ordinary people or even, you know, a political appointee like Tarek or, you know, the director of an office like Josh, when it, especially when it comes to this issue, the president is the one calling the shots. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. And, and you reference a statement. I think it started with Kirby and then Austin, Lloyd Austin repeated it more recently, even I think just a few days ago that there was no evidence of war crimes being committed. And, and of course, Foundation for Middle East Peace is a 501c3 so we don't you know the the organization doesn't take political sides but your point is absolutely important and I, I'll, I'll call it more of an analysis because this is the reality that we're in and something I will name that actually Tarek said early on post his resignation that I think is important for all of us because there is this pressure of we're staring fascism in the face and how could you and blah 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 and, and Tarek's answer was it's incumbent upon the president to earn our support. And I think that's just a really, really important point that I'll, I'll name. Um, and thank you for that. And thank you for your answer. And Nelly. just, I think all of it is, is really important. It actually touches on some of the things that are being asked in the chat. Um, so you hit some of those points. So thank you for that as well. And I'm going to ask each of you um, just to, to talk a little bit more specifically about what came out of your resignation. Uh, and, and somebody actually asked, and feel free to not answer it or answer it if you're comfortable, but sort of the the, um, the realities of bills and mortgages and families and, and all of those kinds of things that obviously have to be considered because regardless of whether government jobs pay a lot or not, they're still they're, they're still contributing to sort of your life livelihood. So um, I'm just going to, I'll start with you, Tarek, if you want to, whichever, however you want to answer that, whichever part you want to take. Yeah, um, it, it certainly had an impact. I, I will say, like, coming out of my resignation, um, I was really fortunate to have a conversation with the secretary right before I left the building for the final time. And he asked me plainly, he was like, is there anything I can do to convince you to stay? Is there anything that I can do to address some of the biggest issues that our agency is currently working on and focusing on? And in particular, like, what can we be doing better to, um, to help like create a more inclusive environment for employees? Like, what do you feel like was missing? And obviously, like my, 
my resignation wasn't related to the Department of Education's work in particular. It was the broader administration's policy on Gaza. But I did have like a structural like issue that I was running into. And I suspect that a lot of other people were running into in that, like you had mentioned how there had been a huge influx of um, descent cables from uh, foreign service officers, State Department, that type of structure and process doesn't exist for any other agency. And so when there are people who work in an agency like the Department of Education, and they have like thousands of people there, there is no way for that agency or its employees to communicate concerns about policies that are affecting them, their loved ones, and uh, the broader American public, because there is no process for dissent channels. Like for me, I could literally go to the secretary's office, have a conversation about why I was so concerned. He would call me and check on me to see how I was doing and how my family was doing. But there are thousands of federal employees who are representing the American people who do not have that type of access or that luxury to be able to call up a cabinet secretary and say, this is horrifying. You have to do something. And so regardless of whether he was communicating that in the in the cabinet to the chief of staff, to the president, to the national security advisor. Like he gave me those opportunities to communicate about that. And so for me, at least, one of the biggest things that was important to address structurally is making sure that the, the president, the people who are representing our country understand the ramifications of their policies and that we create those opportunities to communicate about when there are substantive policy differences that are directly affecting people's lives. And Josh talked about this earlier about how like, you know, there are a lot of times where you might disagree with a policy here or there, but this was something that was like on such a different scale that like creating that opportunity to communicate about the the dissent, the concerns and how widespread that dissent is, is really, really critical in a moment like this where tens of thousands of people are losing their lives including civilians, including humanitarian workers and doctors. And it's just something that like, there needs to be a process for that in terms of like the personal ramifications of resignation. Like, yes, absolutely. There are huge financial ones. Like for me, I have a support system um, with my family, with my wife that like creates this opportunity for me in this moment. She is employed. She's doing really incredible work in her own right. And so having the ability to um, publicly resign, not knowing what was going to happen with my career, with the work that I'm going to be doing, um, not knowing as the Palestinian guy resigning over Israel-Palestine policy, if I was ever going to be like employable in D.C. again, like that was that was a real consideration for me. It was not an easy decision to make, but it was something that I didn't feel like I had any other option. I had to take this step. I had to do it publicly for my own sanity, for my own mental health. I mean, when I tell you, despite how horrific everything is, how much better I slept after resigning, knowing that I was no longer representing this administration for the horrific um, enabling of the violence in Gaza, like, it, it should not be lost on anyone how much of a weight is lifted when you take that type of a step. And so for me, it was, it was beyond like the financial, it was more about what I could do to try and make a difference, to grab a microphone that could speak directly to the president in a moment where I tried every single channel that was previously available to me and had failed to get the message through. And I think to Anel's point, like, I think we are all sending a really important message. And I think but for a lot of people, it's being received really, really well. But I also do think that, like, for the people in power, the fact that there are people who work for you and who are supposed to fall in line feel like they have to take such a drastic and extreme public step is really dis... It, it's ground shaking for them. And I think that they get really defensive and I think that people need to understand that like that's a good thing that they feel that type of pressure because it might make them think twice about continuing down the same policy paths that they have been yeah and and I I do think I just want to name quickly 
the collection of efforts, right? So y'all were inside and made very, very public, impactful, important resignations. We're also seeing, you know, things like the uncommitted movement. We're seeing things like just people literally in the streets um, were, were, you know, thousands and thousands of calls. Like I hear constantly from staff on the Hill, how their emails are backed up, their, their phones are locked because, because there is, it, this has become such an intersectional movement. Um, and all of these pieces I think are pushing, granted, and Josh said this earlier, it's been incremental and not nearly enough. But I think the shifts that we even have seen are because they can't ignore all of us. They can't ignore y'all. They can't ignore the people in the streets. They can't, you know, and so uh, I think all of these things are, are very important and impactful um, and, and can't be downplayed. And I mean, I have feelings on why Pelosi and Schumer have done the things that they've done. But even that, you know, who in a million years was going to imagine Chuck Schumer going after Netanyahu from the Senate floor? Again, another conversation for another day. But, you know, we're seeing these things happen. It's not by accident. I do want to um, pop over to you, Anel, and just hear a little bit about kind of that those, I, I almost said calculus, but that feels really wrong, but just like the thought process and what sort of impacts your resignation um, have had on, on you. Yeah, I, I think I was saying before we got started um, that I, I had expected more hate mail um, and appreciated Tarek's guidance on how to pursue better digital security. Uh, in advance of that, but I, I think I mean there have been people getting getting through to me um, emails, you know, on Twitter, people finding my phone number, and it's been remarkably positive um, in a way that I was not expecting. And I think this does signal a shift in U.S. public opinion on this. I, I imagine my experience is different than you know, in kind of like in the the time frame when Josh resigned and even when Tarek resigned, I do think we we are, um, I hope that we are seeing a real shift here in public opinion. Obviously we have yet to see a real shift in policy, which is what is so appalling given that these are our elected officials who are supposed to represent us. And as Tarek mentioned, the president ha or the, the, the candidate has to earn our support. Um, as far as, um, you know, kind of the, the repercussions I mean, similar to Tarek, I feel very fortunate that my husband remains gainfully employed and has health insurance, you know, for for myself and our our young daughter, um, who's almost two. Um, and I and I also just wanted to echo his point about I was I I had been feeling so devastated emotionally, and although I still feel devastated emotionally, um, I could sleep better. Like I think in the in the initial aftermath of of resigning publicly, I was I just I felt so much better, um, and I, you know, I absolutely um, hope that you know it may take a while, but I hope that maybe this shift in American public opinion might lead to a future administration where I might be employable again to be able to work on on policy issues. Um, short of that, I came from the think tank sector before joining state. I'm hoping and planning to go back to the think tank sector, kind of figuring that out right now. Um, but, you know, I, I, I also just want to acknowledge, like, it is a very difficult decision, and, and I don't fault those who are not in a position to resign either, you know, privately or publicly, because it's, you know, we live in a country where it is very difficult to not have a job. Oh, so true. Uh, uh, Josh, I'll just uh, end this section with you, if you want to speak a little bit to your your experience. Yeah, sure. I, I can be relatively brief. I mean, I think, you know, and I, I've said this to others who have been thinking about resigning as well, um, that, you know, in response to the person who put the question, you know, what about mortgages? What about, you know, healthcare and all that sort of thing? You know, the first piece of advice I give to anyone who's who's in this situation is, you know, that first piece of advice they give you on the airplane, you know, you've got to make sure that your own mask is securely fastened before you help those around you. Uh, and so, you know, there is, first of all, a, a privilege that comes to working in government. There is also a privilege of being in a position where you are able to resign. 
uh, over these issues. Um, and, you know, I mean, for my part, I, I, I certainly had a backup plan, um, which was, you know, I've worked overseas on security sector reform in the past. And, you know, I figured, well, I might not be in Bitcoin in DC, but I can always show up in, you know, some country overseas and, and you know, do some sort of consulting job with the security sector. Um, and again, that's that's a privilege in its own right as well. Um, I, I do think uh, just very quickly on uh, the question of impact um, that I think, you know, all three of us, uh, well, look, I, I think um, you only have as a, member of a vast and powerful government, any one individual only has the tiniest of incremental impacts within government. Uh, and I think it would be unfair to expect anything more than that outside of government. Um, you know, at the same time, I think that the, the conversation is advancing. Um, and I do think, and I take comfort in the notion that, you know, we are on the right side, not only of history, um, but also of where American foreign policy is going to end up. I don't know how long it's going to take, uh, to make the shift that it obviously desperately needs to. Um, but whether that is four years or 10 years, and I don't think it's going to be more than that, to be honest, but somewhere in that range, uh, I do take comfort in a sense um, that there will be, um, that the, the policies will catch up and that we we are on the right side of both morality and history. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Josh, I'm actually going to just stick with you for a moment here and ask a, a kind of a specific question about U.S. behavior with arms transfers. And we mentioned earlier at least twice the president bypassed Congress. Um, you know, there's there's been all these sorts of dynamics. Is that considered unusual? And so that's one question. And then additional question or, or extension of that is what Tell our audience what leverage the president has here and how could he be using it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly Trumpian, right? Um, in the sense that under the Trump administration, they use emergency authorities to bypass Congress to provide arms to the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. Um, you know, again, I think, or not again, but I, I think a major difference here um, is that even within that previous administration, uh, in part because it was such a chaotic mess of a clown show of an administration, there was a lot more space within government uh, to actually have an impact and to, to make a difference. Uh, the Biden administration uh, is a much more regimented uh, administration with power much more effectively centralized and streamlined. Uh, that's great when they're pointing in the right direction. When they're pointing in the wrong direction, it's terrible. Um, but, you know, I, I think in any event, I think what we've also seen, which is just the frankly, ignoring and setting aside of a vast body of relevant US laws, uh, policies, regulations on, you know, that apply to human rights and security systems, human rights and arms transfers, uh, application of international law in the domestic context um, is, is very concerning. And I think should be very concerning even beyond the context of this policy issue, because it sets precedents that future administrations will be sure to exploit in terms of, you know, if there's a law you're avoiding, just don't ask the lawyers for their opinion. Um, you know, if there are, you know, other issues, just, you know, close your eyes, move forward, keep repeating the same BS lines in press conferences. Uh, it's just not a great precedent. So I, 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 you know, I would be very concerned in that context. And then I'm sorry, I forgot what the second part of your question was. No worries. I, I just the, to speak a little bit to the actual leverage President Biden oh, yeah. has yeah. and how should he be using it in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, look, there is a vast amount of leverage here, right? I mean, Israel would not be able to conduct the Gaza operation that it's been conducting in the way that it has been conducting it without a constant flow of U.S. arms. At the very least, a cutting off of those arms would mean that Israel would have to make some very hard choices uh, between, hey, you know, is the priority maintaining a reserve stockpile for other regional contingencies, whether those be with Iran or Hezbollah, which pose a much more significant threat to Israel, uh, or is the priority killing as many people as possible in Gaza? Um, and so the fact that we're not even forcing that conversation, I think, is important. There are other modes of leverage as well, of course, uh, in terms of, you know, the U.S. continues to press uh, for, you know, Saudi Arabia to normalize with Israel, um, you know, and, and you know, I think continues to hope that it can uh, move forward on that within the next month, um, which, you know, seems crazy to me. But 
you know, there, so there are diplomatic, you know, advantages that the UN covers that the US provides to Israel in regional context at the United Nations. Um, you know, there's just a, a, in terms of other areas of technology transfer of international cooperation. Um, and of course, there are punitive measures as well in terms of whether it be visa restrictions, sanctions, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's just an immense amount of leverage that the US has that it could be using and which Israeli officials, including a senior retired Israeli general, has said, you know, if America says stop, we have to stop because they are, you know, they provide everything we use. Um, but I would just say in closing that before we even get to debates about how should we be using our leverage, the first question should be, let's apply our laws. First, apply our own laws. And once we've done that, let's see what's left and then talk about leverage. Because policy Gosh. decisions on yes. leverage don't overcome, you know, legal mandates. Yeah. Uh, oh gosh, spot on, and and actually, kind of a good segue into. And now I want to go to you, in regard to the Biden administration's goals and policies with respects to human rights and and Arab nations and um, how this support on these attacks and this invasion on Gaza is impacts that agenda. Yeah. So while the Biden administration came in saying they were going to center human rights, my experience at DRL, NEA, so Democracy, Human Rights and Labor Bureau and then Office of Near Eastern Affairs was that human rights were not a priority. Um, and that was just sort of acknowledged, you know, that maybe it was talking point number five and it might get bumped. Um, if the principal, you know, the the official delivering those talking points to a, a, a counterpart at another government, you know, maybe they're just they just wouldn't have time to bring up the human rights concern. Um, however, in the aftermath of October seventh, even the work that that my department and office had been able to do, especially as far as working with civil society in the Middle East, trying to um, just keep track of abuses. There are the, the human rights reports that our, our office puts out every year. This became just truly impossible, not only because members of civil society didn't want to have anything to do with the US government, but it also put them at even greater risk because you know they are already, their governments already treat them as a threat. Um, and so if they had any sort of affiliation with the US government that really, uh, Put, made, put a target on their backs even more than before. So overall, the um, I, I just it was really impossible to do my job, um, which again, I, I do consider valuable. I think there's there's also a certain amount of cynicism, you know, I mean, what what level of credibility did the United States have as a proponent of human rights, especially in the Middle East? Um, or as, you know, an adherent to international law. But I do just think, I mean, this is a much broader question than just can my office do its job? It, I mean, it just speaks to America's role in the world and the way that the United States is seen. And this is a big thing that the Biden administration said when they came into power was in contrast with the Trump administration, which was not necessarily motivated by this desire for America to be a moral leader, to you know, maintain alliances, especially in Europe, for example, um, to in thinking about competing with Russia and China and, and kind of what, what will the future of the world look like? And it, will it reflect, hopefully, respect for human rights and, and democracy, for example? And so I, I just, again, not to, to trumpet like my own particular office, but but it does just speak the way that the US has lost credibility on the issues I was working on just speaks to the, the, the hypocrisy with which the rest of the world knows that the United States operates. And I do think in particular to contrast US statements and condemnations of the Russian occupation and war on Ukraine, you know, the absolute and very justified condemnations of that that horrifying conflict and, and Russia's illegal actions contrasted to the absolute lack and, and of condemnation and instead enabling, as, as Josh was saying, I mean, Israel could not do this without the United States providing this constant stream, not only of weapons, but also just of money. 
it is astonishing. I do think it is rooted partly, unfortunately, in racism. And there was a question that came up in the chat about the conflict in Sudan, which unfortunately, you know, is is largely ignored in the media. Um, I I do think that in particular the the question of is of U.S. support for Israel does does make the United States so much more complicit in terms of the genocide in Gaza in a way that dynamics within Sudan, I mean the U.S. is is doesn't have clean hands there either, but. Um, I, I do think there's there's a reason that for so long kind of Israel has existed in the American imagination in a, in a certain shape, and I do think that is changing. And, and I think the longer that this administration, or I mean, I hope Josh is right, that we'll see a shift within like a few years. Um, but I just I fear for for a, a world where the United States has has no credibility on on any of these values that we claim to espouse. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. Uh, I I'm going to shift over to you, Tarek, and talk a little bit about. We were talking about sort of the intersectionality of this moment and the mobilization that we've seen happen um, for for months now, and and thankfully it's not letting up. We can't we can't let up. But and I mentioned the uncommitted campaign within the primaries, and and there's been I think a meaningful impact there. I would love for you to just talk about what you're making, kind of of this. It is new, honestly, in comparison to where we were. Um, and where we've been for decades and it is very intersectional so i'd love for you to just talk a little bit about your thoughts on that why it's happening now and what you kind of make of this new momentum yeah and i just want to touch on one thing that anel just said about like the risk of america losing its credibility at the world stage uh particularly in the context of like human rights issues and i think like in, i remember 2016 like very vividly and i remember that this was a huge concern about Trump becoming president and how big of a risk Trump was. And you needed the adults in the room because we had to maintain our stature at the global stage and Trump was a risk to that. And I think like we're in 2024 now and, and I'm not saying Trump is not a risk to that. He absolutely is. He is like a huge risk to someone like me in particular, a brown man living in the United States. like there's no question about that and as a democrat like i absolutely recognize the risk that trump poses on our democracy as well as on our standing in the world but trump's not the one that's engaging in these policies that makes us look super hypocritical on gaza and israel when he's also like saying like how important it is to stand up for humanitarian rights in Ukraine and condemning the war crimes that Russia is engaged in. Like it, there's no other word for it except hypocrisy. And these are Biden's policies. And it is President Biden whose ideas and positions are being enacted in this very moment that is costing us that credibility. And I think like just tying it to this question that you're raising about the uncommitted campaign and the momentum that it is really building, you know, for me, that momentum is inspirational because these are the base of the Democratic Party. These are people who have historically engaged in the electoral process. These are people who could, like millions of other Americans, dissociate from the political process and not participate in elections. And instead, they're doing the opposite. They're showing up to primaries that historically have super low turnout rates. And they're saying, instead of going out of my way to come to this and cast a vote for the president, I want to send a message to him. I want to engage in the political process to let him know that I have concerns about his policies and what he is enabling and facilitating with our unconditional support of weapons and military funding to Israel and the the massive and catastrophic loss of life and manufactured famine that's happening in Gaza, we don't support that. And it's not just Arab Americans. It's not just Muslim Americans. It is Americans across the board. It is the majority of Democratic voters. It is young Americans. It's old Americans. It's Black Americans. It's Latino Americans. It's 
people in every state of the country. And they're coming out and they're saying, listen to us. They are pleading with the president. They know that Trump is a risk. They know that Trump does not represent their values or their ideals. But the president is not exhibiting the American values and ideals either that we all grew up with and believe in. You know, like the idea is that like the president has an opportunity to actually listen to his voters. And it's not the first time where he has inter has had an opportunity to listen to voters, internalize that, and turn it into policy. The president was not historically a champion of fixing a broken student loan system. I'm bringing in my personal like policy expertise too, but like he was not the student loan guy. He was not the make college free guy. He was not the cancel student debt guy, but he listened to tens of millions of Americans who had repeatedly talked about the incredible damage that the student loan system was creating for them because of mismanagement by the companies that the government was contracting with. He listened to American voters and people with student loans about the burden that student loan debt was having on their ability to have families start businesses, get married, buy homes. And he enacted that into real policy change. Has it been perfect? No, but he certainly listened. He incorporated that and embedded that into his now probably one of his signature uh, policy issues over the course of his first term. He could do that with this too. He could listen to his voters. He could listen to the American people who are pleading for humanity, who are pleading for him to recognize the value of Palestinian lives. He's not doing that right now, but he could. And that's why I think like, uncommitted is so powerful because the people are trying to engage with the process. They are trying to work with the party. They're trying to work with him. They're not saying we're voting for Trump. They're saying, do what we need you to do so we can support you and so that we can support the party. And it's up to the president. It continues to be up to the president. I said it three months ago. People even said it before that. Mm -hmm. It's it's just, yeah. it's him. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to I ask each of you briefly, like 30 second answer here. Sorry to do this to you, but in the interest of time, we we touched on your individual resignations. We talked about your kind of conversations you've even had within your own departments, former colleagues. What message do you have for people that we there is there's some chatter out there about everyone in the administration should be resigning. And this is the thing that everyone needs to do there. Everyone doesn't have access to y'all, I know you're you're all very very uh, engaged with with people who reach out. But but somebody who might be listening or tuning in, what message do you have for them? Quick answer from each of you, and then I'll start with you. I I think one really powerful thing that people are doing is is publicly displaying support for a ceasefire. I know the word cease, you know, like that's getting co opted, but you know, make a sign put it in your window, put it in your yard or, or get one of the, the produced signs because I think people are grieving and suffering over what's happening and they don't realize how widespread that is. Or people who are maybe in a media bubble and are not paying attention to see their neighbors or their friends putting up a public display that like, we just want the killing to stop. I think yeah. that 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 is why we are starting to see a shift here is you know this reflection that people realize you know although this has historically been such a toxic subject mm -hmm. and uh, anyway there's a shift there one other thing i i just want to mention um you know we've we've it's been thank you so much ronnie for such a great conversation but we haven't talked a lot about sort of i'm gonna get emotional like what's happening um inside gaza and i just wanted to say like I recently heard from a nurse who got back, sorry, um, who's saying that, that people are ready to die, like people inside Gaza would rather just die. There's, it's, um, it's just so shocking that six months on this is still happening. And I just, I, I really appreciate the people who, who listened and, and are working on this, um, but just you know, I think there's kind of this perception that there's a shift or like the administration's getting better on this, but aid is not getting in and the bombs are still falling. Um, and it's it's just extremely urgent that that we see a policy change here. Sorry. <laughs> no, please. I mean, I, I feel like I get asked all the time, how are you how are you holding up? And I think it's I'm afraid if I let go, I'll be a puddle in the floor. I think I even said that to you before. And and I and what you're saying is 
is exactly right. And the thing that I think is most gutting, it's all terrible, but, it, but hearing those words from children that they would rather be dead than, than continue to exist in the, in the nightmare that they're living in every single day. So I, I appreciate you for centering that and, and bringing that back. Cause at the end of the day, it's real easy to say 35,000 dead, 14,500 children and, and just sort of get lost in the, the numbers when the reality is there's a human being behind every single one of those numbers who belong to somebody. Um, a, a friend of mine always says somebody's precious child, every single one of those people is somebody's precious child. So, so thank you very much, Anel. Um, Josh, I'll jump over to you. Yeah, I, I think we're out of time, so I'll be very quick. Um, I, there is an urgency to this moment, but there is also a need for uh, a continued effort. Uh, this is not going to be something, even if the American policy on providing arms to Israel changed overnight, which I guarantee you it will not, um, it is still going to take many, many years of effort to shift things. So the first thing I'll say is take care of yourselves. Uh, Self-care is really important, finding that time away from this issue. Uh, we have that privilege, right? Um, uh, or at least for those of us who have that privilege. Um, but but supporting yourself, supporting those around you, and, and then also organizing, networking, uh, finding other like-minded people, um, both to support each other and to campaign together, but also because you never know uh, what opportunities uh, you know others bring, what connections they bring. Um, I've certainly encountered a vast number of opportunities just through talking to people to, to make a difference uh, since leaving government uh, and then being prepared for this to be the long haul. And we're going to have to keep engaging in this uh, space, uh, including in the American political space for many years to come. So it's a marathon, not a sprint. Absolutely. Thank you. Tarek, final word. I'll also try to keep it short. Um, there are a lot of really great advocacy organizations that... Um, you know, do collective actions um, here in DC and across the country and the world. If you have the ability to join one of those, volunteer your time, support those, those efforts, call your representatives, write letters, donate both to humanitarian aid organizations that are doing life-threatening and life-saving work. Um, but also, you know, in America, the reality for better or worse is that money is power. You can politically donate. You can donate to people who represent your values. And there are attacks against a lot of those um, those candidates in this moment by other moneyed interests. And it is not lost on anyone that um, this is a really critical juncture in American politics and American foreign policy. Um, you know, join de public demonstrations, push your bosses. I think there is never a shortage of having difficult conversations with people who are in power, people who make decisions, people who can make a difference, people whose voices may be heard if yours is not. And so having those conversations is really important, even though they can be difficult. And I think if you can resign, if that is something that you feel like you need to do for your moral clarity, for your life, and you have the capacity and ability to do it, even if you don't do it publicly, there are a lot of people who I have heard from, who I've spoken with, who have made the decision to resign, but did not choose to do it publicly. It is still powerful. It continues to send a message. But if you're able to be public, I think that your voice will be welcomed. I think people will support you. There are networks who are ready to um, to provide you with all kinds of support. And um, I'm extremely grateful for the people who have reached out. And if anyone does want to have a conversation about what it looks like for um, your personal life, for your digital security, for your personal security, I have had many of those conversations and I'm always happy to continue having those conversations. I have an email that is public that is in my Twitter bio and also in my Instagram bio. So I try to be accessible and I try to be responsive. Thank you so much. Thanks all three of you, Tarek, Anel, and Josh for having this very important conversation. Thanks to everyone who joined us live or is watching or listening uh, after we post it. Please check back at the FMEP website, www.fmep.org for video and audio of this webinar and for a list of resources relating to the conversation that we just had as well as all future programming. Thanks so much for joining.